Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another Your Soul Matters broadcast. This broadcast is brought to you by the House of Deliverance Church. I'm your host, Tatiana Cody. It is our hope that this broadcast and the message you're about to hear will inspire you, encourage you, and convince you that your soul truly does matter. It matters to God. It matters to us here at the House of Deliverance Church, and we hope that it matters to you. Let's welcome our speaker this morning, Evangelist Regina Swink. Amen. Praise the Lord, and good morning, everybody. Amen. This morning we're going to be coming from 1 Samuel 6, 15, and it reads, And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, with wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And uh, for a theme I have, where's your sacrifice? In 1 Samuel chapters 5 and 6, we read of the Philistines who were victorious in the recent battle against God's people. And as a result, the Ark of God has been captured by the Philistines. After capturing the Ark, they placed it in the house of Dagon, their god, in their city of Ashdod. They get up early the next morning and, and, uh, to find Dagon off his pedestal, lying face down before the Ark. They pick it up and place him back in his place. <laughs> Now, it seems to me that these fellas would have had, you know, said to themselves, maybe we might be serving the wrong God. Because I don't want to serve a God that not only can he not help me, but he can't help himself. He can't even take care of himself. I don't want a God that I have to prop up and I have to place back on his pedestal, right? I don't want a God that can neither hear, deliver, nor answer me, right? But nevertheless, they take Dagon back in his place and go, uh, go about their business. So they get up early the next morning, uh, not only to find Dagon back on his face, but this time uh, his head has been removed as well as his hands. And the only thing that is left is his stump. Now again, you know, uh, I'm like, fellas, fellas, something should have clicked and said, maybe we're serving the wrong God, right? Maybe be, because they should have realized at this point uh, that the God of the Israelites was truly God, and there is no other God beside him, right? Can I get a witness on that? Amen? Amen. There is no other God. So this should have occurred to them, but nevertheless. So while the ark is in the Philistines' land, the Bible says God's hand was heavy against them. God smote every Philistine male with hard, painful, bloody tumors called emeralds in their private parts, okay? Because God's hand was so heavy against them in destroying them, the men of Ashdod decided to take the Ark of God to Gath, a neighboring Philistine city. They take the Ark to Gath. God's hand is heavy on them. All the men break out with these same hard, painful, bloody tumors in their private parts. They move it to Ekron. Same thing happens. God strikes them with painful, bloody tumors in their private parts. The men of Ekron ask, why did you bring this ark here? You know what it did to you? Why'd you bring it here? Right? So, so that, you know, the God of Israel may slay us? Why did you do this? So again, so the five tribes involved here, five Philistine tribes decide, let's send him back, send the ark back to his own place. And they agreed to send the ark back to the people of God. But they reasoned, let's not send it back empty. But let's send a trespass offering so that we might appease the God of the Israelites so that he might remove his hand from upon us because God is doing damage amongst these Philistines. The Bible says they fashioned a new cart along with two young female cows that have never been yoked. They fashioned five golden emeralds and five golden mice as well as part of their offering, right? The Philistines sent the cart, the cows, and all on their way. Now they watch it from a distance, and it's as if God has placed a supernatural GPS on this cart, right? And you, you know how it goes, uh, you have reached your destination, right? So God, and the Bible says they didn't turn to the left, it didn't turn to the right, it went directly, amen, to the town of Beth Shemesh, and went directly to the great stone, which was appropriate for the sacrifice. God is all in this mix, yes. right? So the men of Beth Shemesh, right, who are busy reaping their wheat harvest, they see the ark coming from a distance. They begin to rejoice. Yeah. They're excited. Yes, 
God's ark is coming back, right? Now the ark represented not just the blessings of God, it represented the favor of God. It also represented the very presence of God among his people. So the Bethshemites are rejoicing. The Levites are making ready to offer the sacrifices, and there is great joy in Bethshemesh. Which takes us to 1 Samuel 6 and 19, and it reads, And he smote the men of Bethshemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. Now, when I first read this, you know, I was a little confused. I'm like, you know, God, what's happening here, right? When I first read this, right, the ark was among his people again, right? Check. They offered sacrifices to God. Check. And then God proceeds to kill a bunch of them. So, and I thought, God, they just made the sacrifice, okay? So, you know, why are you killing your people? But it, re but it occurred to me, whose sacrifice was it really, right? The Bible says the Philistines provided the cart. The Philistines provided the cows. The Philistines provided the gold. God directed the cows where to go. God even provided the great stone for the sacrifice. So what did the men of Beshemesh actually provide for the sacrifice? I don't see anywhere where it says the men of Beshemesh added anything to the sacrifice. They didn't bring any offerings. They didn't bring a cow. They didn't bring any turtle doves, no gold, no silver. They brought nothing. As a matter of fact, I don't recall reading that the men of Beshemesh gathered a troop to retrieve their treasured ark that they loved so dearly, right? That they were so joyful to see, yes, it's back, but they, I, I see nowhere where they went to retrieve this treasured uh, ark that they so dearly loved. Actually, it says that they were going about the business of life as if nothing had happened. They were reaping the wheat harvest. It was business as usual. The ark of God had been with the Philistines for at least seven months. Seven months without the presence of God among them. The ark of God has been in enemy hands and it was still business as usual. So yes, they performed the acts of sacrificing, but they were just going through the motions. They were riding on the coattails of the Philistines' right. sacrifice. Right. They were depending on the Philistines' sacrifice to cover them as well. They didn't have the heart that David had when he said, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God of that which cost me nothing. Right. right? They were willing to offer what didn't cost them a yeah. thing. Yeah. Yes, I hear somebody saying, but salvation is free. Yes, it's free, but it will cost you something. Right? So they were happy riding on the coattails of the Philistines. All they saw when they saw the ark was the blessings of God is returning, right? They wanted the blessings only. But what about what God requires? Being a Beshemesh, right? What about pleasing God? What pleases him? Forget about all that. Just give us the blessings. That was their attitude. Now, how did you come to that conclusion? I'm glad you asked. Because after the sacrifices were made, they were so happy with themselves by their actions and their attitude, right? Look at what we did, patting each other on the back. We did this, y'all, right? They thought they deserved, they earned the right to investigate the Ark of God. Now remember, the Ark of God represented the very presence of God. They knew God already forbade anyone to touch, right. let alone open right. the Ark of God. They right. had no reference yeah. for the presence of Almighty God. Right. They dare to pry open his Ark, right? It was as if God owed them something. Here, we've done this for you, God. Surely we can do this, right? See what I've done, God? Now you owe me. They thought the rules didn't apply to them. I know some of us are saying, wow, those Beshemites, well, they were really messed up. <laughs> but do we do the same thing sometimes? Do we rely on the prayers and the dedication of others to cover us? Do we rely on the commitment, the right standing with God and the sacrifices of others instead of building our own commitments and relationship with God? I've learned sometimes we don't always appreciate, as humans, we don't always appreciate things when we don't have to work for them for ourselves, right? The Beshemites, they didn't appreciate all that the Philistines went through 
to provide this sacrifice. They knew nothing of the blood, the sweat, the pain, the tears that the Philistines went through to get to the place where they realized the need for a sacrifice. These uncircumcised Philistines knew enough to know that they had offended the God of old and needed to offer this trespass sacrifice. These, these are uncircumcised. They have no covenant, no relationship with God, but they are more righteous than God's people in that they realize we have offended this God of the Israelites, so we've got to send a trespass offering. The Beshemites couldn't relate to that. They simply thought that God, des they deserved it. They had a, a mentality of God owed us this, right? God was so angry with the disdain of the Beshemites and their willful disobedience that he kills 50,070 men right there. Now I'm like, when I saw the first one fall, I'd be like, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, you know what do I need to do? I'm so sorry. But no, right? In, uh, in 1 Samuel 6 and 20, and the men of Beshemesh said, who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from? They have taken on the same mentality of the Philistines. Get this ark away from us. He's too hard. This God is too hard. He's cruel. He's mean. Who can stand? before him, right? They are saying God is too hard instead of accepting the responsibility for their own actions. They are blaming God. You too hard, God. If you wasn't so hard, we wouldn't be dead. What? Right? They performed the sacrifices. Yes, they did. But their heart wasn't in it. They looked the part. But looks can be deceiving. 2 Samuel 16 and 7 says, tell, tells us, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. They looked the part. They looked like God's people, but there was something lacking in their hearts. So the question I have for you today, for all of us, where is your sacrifice? Wow. Psalms 51 and 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. So if you find, after hearing all of this, that you have been in a place that you've been skating by on somebody else's sacrifice, you've been allowing somebody else to do the work, and you've been trying to reap the benefits of somebody else's commitment, somebody else's walk, listen, it's not too late for you. Amen. It's not too late to turn your heart to God, to repent. And confess, God, it's me. I've done this thing. I'm the one that sinned. Nobody made me do it. God, I did this of my own volition. I decided to do this, God. I'm sorry for walking contrary to your word. I'm sorry for doing things my own way. I'm sorry, oh God, that I've offended you. I've grieved you. I've disappointed you. So stop making excuses. It's not too late. Stop passing the buck. Stop looking for somebody else to blame. Accept that God, I am, I'm the one that sinned. Yeah. Lord, create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit in me. I'm the one that's failed you, God. Stop looking for mama and daddy to pay the way for you. Stop relying on grandma and grandpa and your Sunday school teacher, whoever else. And you do what you have to do. You do the work. Father, I messed up. I grieved and disappointed you. Please save me. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness, God. And forgive me, God, for taking your grace for granted. Yes. Forgive me for taking your goodness for granted. God, I know it's nobody but me. And when we can do that, the Bible says God will not despise that broken heart. He won't turn you away when you have a contrite heart and acknowledge that it is me, God. It's me standing in the need of prayer. It's me, God. Have mercy on me, God. Because I know, God, I failed you. Yeah. I can't blame nobody. I can't blame what my mama did when I was growing up. God, it's me. Yeah. And if we will accept that, I have all confidence that if the men of Beshemite would have turned their hearts to God and fallen on their faces and repented, that God would have allowed perhaps his ark to stay there longer. Perhaps God would have found, they would have found favor with the Lord. So the question I have for you today is, where's your sacrifice? Just heard 
As the evangelist said, where is your sacrifice? Where is your commitment? Is your heart truly with the Lord? If you are looking to learn more about God, come visit us. Information can be found at our website, hodchurch.com. If you would like prayer or in need of someone to talk to, please call 1-800-741-SOUL or 1-800-741-7685. We look forward to seeing you next week for another inspired message and messenger. Until then, don't forget, your soul matters. Yes.